you. Thank you. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Is that great? Thank you all for coming. This is so cool. This is my first event at, at an REI. <laughs> I've been doing bookstores and libraries and everything, so it's really exciting um, to be here tonight. Um, when I was writing the book, you know, REI, how many of you have read Wild? Oh my gosh, <laughs> good work. So the few of you who haven't, you know, we, you, need, you need to get to work here. But, um, you know, I was writing the book and, and um, REI just really became kind of a character in the book, um, as you know, because uh, it was, it was the, the really the, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about it. I'm going to read about REI too. So I think that, um, that what I'd like to do is really just kind of start off with, uh, you know, how, how it came to be that I even took this long walk on the PCT that then became the book that was wild. Um, I was living in Minneapolis at the time, um, and um, there had been a blizzard. I was working as a waitress. I, was t I, was, I just turned 26. And um, I was at this place in my life, the, the day I decided to hike on the PCT. I was really at this uh, place in my life when I think of as essentially the bottom. Um, f three and a half years before, when I was a senior in college, um, my mom had gotten suddenly uh, ill with what we first thought was a cold, and then quickly we learned that she had cancer, and she died seven weeks later at the age of 45. And those of you, I know there are a lot of people in the room who will understand what I mean when I say this, um, those of you who have experienced this kind of loss, of somebody who really is essential to you, really essential uh, to your life. Um, know that the world ends when someone like that dies. And that's how it felt to me at that moment. My mom uh, was my mom. She was my only parent, and she loved me and my siblings the way you hope a mother will. And when she died, I didn't know who I was going to be in the world and how I was going to live in the world without her. And it was also uh, the case that, you know, even that I was at that moment, I was in my early 20s when I was really just trying to figure out, um, you know, like we all have to do at that age, who we are. And so the world that didn't hold my mother anymore was, was a world that, um, in which I tried to be strong in my grief, I tried, to, I tried to do the things that you hope you'll do, and then ultimately by that day that I was in the REI in Minneapolis, um, I had done a lot of things that, that you hoped that you won't. Um, <laughs> I had been married, I married really young to a really good guy who I loved very much. And, but in my grief and in my youth and in my, all of that stuff, you know, I, I did all sorts of things um, you're not supposed to do when you're married to somebody. I was wildly promiscuous. I got involved with a guy who was a heroin addict and got involved with heroin myself. And, you know, essentially I felt when I say at that bottom point, I, I felt like, you know, who am I anymore? And I didn't even recognize myself. I, I wasn't um, the woman my mother had raised me to be. So sometimes life hands you, you know, life is like one big metaphor sometimes. And um, so there was a blizzard and I needed to sh a shovel and I wanted to buy a compact shovel. And so of course I went to REI. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a foldable shovel here? Um, so, and I was standing in line waiting to pay for it. And there was a little row of books kind of by the, the cash register. And thankfully I had, there was a line. And I glanced over and just to kill time, I picked up one of the books that was sitting there. And the book was called The Pacific Crest Trail, Volume 1, California. I had never heard of the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, how, how many of you in here, and I know you probably, this is a pretty, a PCT knowledgeable crowd, but how many of you, and don't be shy, how many of you had never heard of the PCT until you read Wild? Okay. Usually, all over the country, I ask that question, it's like two-thirds of the audience, you know? So this is, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. So back in 19, this was December of 94, um, I hadn't heard of it. I'd never heard of the Appalachian Trail either. 
Um, I didn't even really know there was such a thing as long distance backpacking. I knew that, you know, people went out on backpacking trips, but I didn't understand this whole thing of like through hiking and hiking for months and so forth. But so I picked that up and I read the back of the book and it described this national scenic trail that goes from Mexico to Canada through California, Oregon, and Washington. And it just, just absolutely, just blew me away. First of all, that that exists in this beautiful country of ours. The, the people before us um, had the foresight to, to set aside and protect that wild corridor from, from border to border. We're so lucky that we have that. Um, and I knew that it was just this big, grand, magnificent thing. And I knew that I was not a grand and magnificent thing. But I had grown up in the north woods of Minnesota, in, in the woods and in, in, a, in, a, in the wild, I was really comfortable in that sort of place. And I knew that that, that was where I felt best, it was where I felt the most gathered at this moment that I was so frayed and not gathered. And so I just thought there was something inside of me that just sort of opened. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna go hike on this trail. Um, I didn't have enough time, time, time was at that point in my life money. So I didn't have enough money that I could take off the five or six months it would take to hike the whole trail. So I said, well, I'll do, about as, I'll do as much as I can do in about 100 days. So I um, went back to my waitressing job and doubled up on my shifts and started saving um, my money. Um, instead of spending it on gin every night, I would go home and put it in a box. And at the end of the week on my day off, I would go to REI. Um, <laughs> they were always happy to see me. Um, I paid in cash. And um, what I would do is, so the only resource I had for my PCT hike was the Pacific Crest Trail Volume 1 California. Okay, that was the only book. And it wasn't, I mean, I was an idiot, but it wasn't just that I was an idiot. Um, I remember going to the, uh, the Minneapolis Public Library and they're just, you know, there weren't that many materials about the Pacific Crest Trail. And you have to remember, too, this is before the internet. Or, you know, the internet existed, but, like, only Al Gore had it, you know? <laughs> so I didn't know what the internet was. I mean, nobody was even on it. There was nobody to email, even if you had email. Um, so, you know, now you can go online and you, you can find out, I mean, you could be reading people's journals, I mean, journals, you know, really day by day. I mean, it's a whole different world now. Um, but then it was just harder to get information. So I had that book, that book was my Bible, and essentially the, the ministers, if you will, the preachers of this Bible were the employees of REI, <laughs> who every week I would go in and say, well, you know, I'm gonna go hike on the PCT, and I need a stove, or I need a water purifier, or I need, and, and w everything that I imagined I needed, they sold to me, plus a whole bunch of other stuff that looked kind of cute. Um, <laughs> so I brought all this stuff um, to the town of Mojave, California um, in early June. I, I left Minneapolis, I got a divorce, I closed my life down, there, drove to Portland, Oregon, left, left my things there and left my, my resupply boxes that I'd packed for myself with a friend um, that she would be mailing to me throughout the summer. And I flew to Los Angeles and I got myself to the little town of Mojave and I checked into a hotel, a motel, that cost $18 for the night. And here's what happened. So I'm just gonna read this, um, this, this, this will just take maybe I think like seven minutes to read. It's chapter three. It's called Hunching in a Remotely Upright Position, which I think gives you a clue of what's to come. When I woke the next morning in my room at White's Motel, I showered and stood naked in front of the mirror, watching myself solemnly brush my teeth. I tried to feel something like excitement, but came up with only a morose unease. Every now and then I could see myself, truly see myself, and a sentence would come to me thundering like a god into my head. And as I saw myself then in front of that tarnished mirror, what came to me was the woman with a hole in her heart. That was me. That was why I'd longed for a companion the night before. That was why I was here, naked in a motel with this preposterous idea of hiking alone for three months on the PCT. I set my toothbrush down, then leaned into the mirror and stared into my own eyes. I could feel myself disintegrating inside myself 
like a past bloom flower in the wind. Every time I moved a muscle, another petal of me blew away. Please, I thought, please. I went to the bed and looked at my hiking outfit. I'd laid it out carefully on the bed before I'd gotten into the shower, the way my mom had done for me when I was a child on the first day of school. When I, when I was a child on the first day of school, I put on my bra and t-shirt, my socks and my boots, then went to the window and pushed the curtain back. The sun was blinding against the white stones of the parking lot. There was a gas station across the way, a good place to hitch a ride to the PCT, I supposed. When I let go of the curtain, the room went dark again. I liked it that way, like a safe cocoon that I'd never have to leave, though I knew I was wrong. It was nine in the morning and already hot outside. The vented white metal box in the corner came alive with its breezy roar. In spite of everything that implied I was going nowhere, I had some place to be. It was day one on the PCT. I opened the compartments of my pack and pulled everything out, tossing each item under the bed. I lifted the plastic bags and emptied them too, then stared at the pile of things. It was everything I had to carry for the next three months. There was a blue compression sack that held the clothes I wasn't already wearing, a pair of fleece pants, a long-sleeved thermal shirt, a thick fleece anorak with a hood, two pair of wool socks and two pair of underwear, a thin pair of gloves, a sun hat, a fleece hat, and rain pants, and another sturdier sack called a dry bag packed to the gills with all the food I'd need over the next 14 days before I reached my first resupply stop at a place called Kennedy Meadows. There was a sleeping bag and a camp chair that could be unclipped to use as a sleeping pad and a headlamp like the kind miners wear and five bungee cords. There was a water purifier and a tiny collapsible stove, a tall aluminum canister of gas and a little, and a little pink lighter. There was a small cooking pot nested inside a larger cooking pot and utensils that folded in half, and a cheap pair of sport sandals I intended to wear in camp at the end of each day. There was a quick dry pack towel, a thermometer keychain, a tarp, an insulated plastic mug with a handle. There was a snake bite kit and a Swiss army knife, a miniature pair of binoculars and a fake leather zip-up case, and a coil of fluorescent, fluorescent colored rope, a compass I hadn't yet learned how to use, and a book that would teach me how to use the compass <laughs> called Stain Found, which is right there, <laughs> that I had intended to read on the plane to LA, but hadn't. There was a first aid kit in a pristine red canvas case that snapped shut, and a roll of toilet paper in a Ziploc bag, and a stainless steel trowel that had its own black sheath that said, you dig it on the front. There was a small bag of toiletries and personal items I thought I'd need along the way. Shampoo and conditioner, soap and lotion and deodorant, nail clippers, insect repellent, sunscreen, a hairbrush, and a natural menstrual sponge, a tube of waterproof sunblock lip balm. There was a flashlight and a metal candle lantern with a votive candle inside and an extra candle and a foldable saw for what I did not know and a green nylon, nylon bag with my tent inside. There were two 32-ounce plastic water bottles and a dromedary bag capable of holding 2.6 gallons of water and a nylon fist that unfurled into a rain cover for my backpack and a Gore-Tex ball that opened up to become my rain coat. There were things I brought in case the other things I brought failed. Extra batteries, a box of waterproof matches, a Mylar blanket, and a bottle of iodine pills. There were two pens and three books in addition to Stain Found, The Pacific Crest Trail, Volume 1, California, William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, and Adrian Rich's The Dream of a Common Language. There was an 11 by 8, 200 page hardback sketchbook that I used as a journal, and a Ziploc bag with my driver's license inside and a small wad of cash, a sheaf of postage stamps, a tiny spiral notebook with the addresses of friends scrawled on a few pages. There was a full-sized, professional quality, 35 millimeter Minolta X700 camera with a separate attachable, attachable zoom lens and another separate attachable flash and a tiny collapsible tripod, 
all of which was packed inside a padded camera case the size of a football. <laughs> Not that I was a photographer. <laughs> I'd gone to an outdoor store in Minneapolis called REI about a dozen times over the previous months to purchase a good portion of these items. Seldom was this a straightforward affair. To buy even a water bottle without first thoroughly considering the latest water bottle technology was folly, I soon learned. <laughs> there were the pros and cons of various materials to take into account, not to mention the research that had been done regarding design. And this was only the smallest, least complex of the purchases I had to make. The rest of the gear I would need was ever more complex. I realized after consulting with the men and women of REI, who inquired hopefully if they could help me whenever they spotted me before displays of ultralight stoves or strolling among the tents. These employees ranged in age and manner, an area of wilderness adventure proclivity, but what they had in common was that every last one of them could talk about gear with interest and nuance for a length of time that was so dumbfounding <laughs> <laughs> that I was that I was ultimately bedazzled by it. <laughs> they cared if my sleeping bag had a snag-free zipper guard and a face muff that allowed the hood to be cinched snug without obscuring my breathing. <clears throat> they took pleasure in the fact that my water purifier had a pleated glass fiber element for increased surface area. And their knowledge had a way of rubbing off on me. By the time I made the decision about which backpack to purchase, a top-of-the-line Gregory hybrid external frame the claim to have the balance and agility of an internal, I felt as if I'd become a backpacking expert. It was only as I stood gazing at that pile of meticulously chosen gear on the bed of my Mojave motel room that I knew with profound humility that I was not. I worked my way through the mountain of things, wedging and cramming and forcing them into every available space of my pack until nothing more could possibly fit. I'd planned to use the bungee cords to attach my food bag, tent, tarp, clothing sack, and camp chair that doubled as a sleeping bag to the outside of my pack. But now it was apparent that there were other things that would have to go on the outside too. I pulled the bungee cords around all the things I'd planned to and then looped a few extra things through them as well. I clipped the metal trowel and its you dig it sheath to my backpack's belt and attached the keychain that was the thermometer to one of my backpack's zippers. When I was done, I sat on the floor, sweaty from my exertions, and stared peaceably at my pack. And then I remembered one last thing, water. I'd chosen to begin my hike where I had simply because from there I estimated it would take me about 100 days to walk where I wanted to go. Months ago, I'd traced my finger southward down the map adding up the miles and the days, and stopped at Tehachapi Pass, where the PCT crosses Highway 58 in the northwest corner of the Mojave Desert, not far from the town of Mojave. What I hadn't realized until a couple of weeks before was that I was beginning my hike on one of the driest sections of the trail, a section where even the fastest, fittest, and most seasoned hikers couldn't always get from one water source, source to another each day. For me, it would be impossible. It would take me two days to reach the first water source 17 miles into my hike, I guessed, so I would have to carry enough to get me through. I filled my 32-ounce water bottles in the bathroom sink and put them in my packs and put them in my packs mesh side pockets. I dug out my dromedary bag that I'd crammed into the main compartment of my pack and filled up two point, all 2.6 gallons of it. Water, I later learned, was 8.3 pounds a gallon. <laughs> I don't know how much my pack weighed that first day, but I do know that the water alone was 24.5 pounds. <laughs> and it was an unwieldy 24.5 pounds. The dromedary bag was like a giant, flattish water balloon, sloshing and buckling and slipping out of my hands and flipping itself onto the floor as I attempted to secure it to my pack. The bag was rimmed with webbing straps, and with great effort, I wove the bungee cords through them next to the camera bag and the sandals and the insulated cup and the candle lantern until I grew so frustrated that I pulled out the insulated cup and threw it across the room. Finally, when everything was, I was going to carry was in the place that I needed to carry it, a hush came over me. I was ready to begin. I looked at my pack. It was at once enormous 
and compact, mildly adorable and intimidatingly self-contained. It had an animate quality. In its company, I didn't feel entirely alone. Standing, it came up to my waist. I gripped it and bent to lift it. It wouldn't budge. <laughs> I squatted and grasped its frame more robustly and tried to lift it again. Again, it did not move, not even an inch. I tried to lift it with both hands, with my legs braced beneath me, while attempting to wrap it in a bear hug, with all of my breath and my might and my will, with everything in me. And still it would not come. It was exactly like attempting to lift a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> it looked so cute, so ready to be lifted. <laughs> and yet it was impossible to do. I sat down on the floor beside it and pondered my situation. How could I carry a backpack more than a thousand miles over rugged mountains and waterless deserts if I couldn't even budget an inch in an air-conditioned motel room? The notion was preposterous, and yet I had to lift that pack. It hadn't occurred to me that I wouldn't be able to. I'd simply thought that if I added up all the things I needed in order to go backpacking, it would equal a weight that I could carry. The people at REI, it was true, had mentioned weight rather often in their soliloquies. <laughs> But I hadn't paid much attention. It seemed that there had been more important questions to consider, like whether a face muff allows the hood to be cinched snug without obscuring my breathing. I thought about what I might take out of the pack, but each item struck me as either so obviously needed or so in case of emergency necessary that I didn't dare remove it. I would have to carry the pack as it was. I scooted over the carpet and situated myself on my rump right in front of my pack, wove my arms through the shoulder straps, and clipped the sternum strap across my chest. I took a deep breath and began rocking back and forth <laughs> to gain momentum, until finally I hurled myself forward with everything in me and got myself onto my hands and knees. My backpack was no longer on the floor. It was officially attached to me. It still seemed like a Volkswagen Beetle, only now it seemed like a Volkswagen Beetle that was parked on my back. <laughs> I stayed there for a few moments trying to get my balance. Slowly, I worked my feet beneath me while simultaneously scaling the metal cooling unit that was attached to the wall with my hands until I was vertical enough that I could do a deadlift. The frame of the pack squeaked as I rose, it too strained from the tremendous weight. By the time I was standing, which is to say hunching in a remotely upright position, I was holding the vented metal panel that I'd accidentally ripped loose from the cooling unit. <laughs> I couldn't even begin to reattach it. The place it needed to go was only inches out of my reach, but those inches were entirely out of the question. I propped the panel against the wall, buckled my hip belt, and staggered and swayed around the room. My center of gravity pulled in every direction I so much as leaned. The weight dug painfully into the tops of my shul shoulders, so I cinched my hip belt tighter and tighter still, trying to balance the burden squeezing my middle so tightly that my flesh ballooned out on either side. My pack rose up like a mantle behind me, towering several inches above my head, and gripped me like a vice all the way down to my tailbone. It felt pretty awful, and yet perhaps this was how it felt to be a backpacker. <laughs> I didn't know. I only knew that it was time to go. So I opened the door and stepped into the light. So I had never gone backpacking um, before. Um, so uh, those of you who thought you were buying like a how-to book, you know, this is not this is a what not to do. So I had never gone backpacking before, and it was only in that motel room that it really occurred to me. Um, and it was that I had done so much hiking. A lot, a lot of radio interviewers, you know, will go, "Now you'd never hiked before," and I was like, "No, that's not true. I was an avid hiker when I decided to hike the PCT, um, but I had never. I was, I had been under the the misconception that a day hike um, is the same as a backpacking trip, and um, they they have almost like nothing in common. You know, one of them, you wake up in your bed, you know, and you go to brunch, um, you, <laughs> you. You have a latte. Maybe you go to the buffet because you know you're going to go for a hike. Um, 
you gorge on you know locks and pancakes, and then and then you go and have a hike, and um, at the end of the day you get back in your car and then you drive to a pub and order a glass of Chardonnay and a cheeseburger and you go back to your bed. You know, it's like a you know. And um, I thought, well, I thought it would just be a, like a bunch of those crammed together, um, but it wasn't like that at all. Um, backpacking, you have to carry all your crap. And um, go into and come what may, and you don't sleep in a bed, and you don't drink Chardonnay, and you don't get to do any of those lovely things. Um, and so I had a lot to learn, um, and I learned it. The trail taught me what I needed to know, um, and in every way, in every way, both spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and physically, it schooled me. And you know, I think when I um, when I when I really reflect on. What, what's at the heart of wild, like what wild is really about, why I wrote the book. You know, I didn't write the book because I took a hike. I, I wrote the book because I'm a writer, and I think that something about this ex very personal experience I had is universal. I mean, you know, probably several of you, of you in the room here have hiked further and better and all kinds of, done, you know, more difficult adventures than me. Um, but I just wanted to tell a story about something I did that was really hard and the, and the way that the wilderness did teach me. And I think that um, what Wild is really about is it's right there in that scene where, you know, I have this pack and I can't lift it, but I have to. Like, the, the only thing that I knew I had to do was lift that pack. That there was, like, not lifting it was not an option. And, and it's a paradox because, of course, I couldn't lift it and I had to lift it. And, um, and Wild is about how I did that physically. And it's also about how I did that emotionally. Because I, was, I went out there living in a world that I couldn't bear. You know, I could not bear the world without my mom. I couldn't bear the world that had me in it, me, the me who had you know, made mistakes and done things I regretted. And so, you know, so much of that, that um, experience and then the writing, of, the writing of that experience is about that, how, how we humans um, bear what we can't bear. Because we all do. We all do it in different ways throughout our lives. And so I think, um, I think that that's what Wild is really, really about. So I could read to you more, or I could take questions. <laughs> I'm just curious. Um, maybe I should read a little shorter passage. Um, so what happened is I got out there. I didn't see another human being for the first eight days of my hike, um, which was really, really intense. Um, because I, I went out there. I knew I was going to be alone. I wanted to be alone. But I, I didn't realize how remote the trail was. And um, you know, it just so happened, the, the rest of my hike, I didn't ever go eight days without seeing another person. But I often would go two or three days without seeing another person. Um, and I just happened to hit this one stretch of trail at this one moment where I was, you know, I just didn't encounter anyone. And um, you know, it was much harder than I thought. I was hiking much more slowly um, than I thought I would because I was carrying such a heavy pack. You know, I just, it was hard. And, and everywhere that the pack made contact with my body, um, it chafed me and, and uh, I got blisters and you know, I was ble you know, bleeding, you know, like my tailbone was, was actually bleeding. And um, my feet were killing me, my, I had blisters, you know, it was all these problems. And I had put the wrong kind of gas in um, my stove, um, so I couldn't get my stove to work, I couldn't cook a lot of the food I was carrying. And, um, and, I, and at one point I ran into a, I, I looked up on the trail and um, there was a very large brown horned beast um, <laughs> running down the trail towards, like, at me. And, um, you know, I'm from Minnesota, you know, so, I, and I didn't expect to see a horned brown beast, you know, really anywhere on my hike. Um, but so when it was there, the only thing I could think of um, was that it was a moose, even though I knew it wasn't a moose. So I'm yelling, moose, moose. And it, you know, so I, it was a Texas longhorn bull that had gone feral. So there were all these things that happened that I had to realize, like, this is just way harder you know, than, than I thought it was going to be. And then you know, I, I get, um, I finally, on like the 10th day of my hike, I meet a, another backpacker, like a real backpacker. And it's the first time, the other day, um, at some event, some man said, I, what I didn't understand is, you know, those first couple weeks you're out there, like, why didn't you, you know, lighten your pack? You know, you were so much suffering with this heavy pack. And I said, well, I didn't, I didn't know that, like, I didn't know that I was carrying a heavy pack. 
You know, I, I mean, I knew it was heavy, but I didn't know it was any more heavy than anyone else's pack. So this guy comes along. Um, I call him Greg in the book, and I've reconnected with him. He lives, he actually, as it happens, lives in Portland now, and we've re reconnected since then. But he's the first, like, real, you know, backpacker on the trail I've met. And um, I see instantly that, you know, he's like, you know, like 10 times more fit than me, and my pack is 10 times bigger than his. And um, he's just like, whoa, what do you have in there? You know, everyone was like, <laughs> like, they were like, what is, what is even in there? You know, they don't even know, you know. Um, I was like, a saw. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was like, you know, if you, in case we wanted to cut down any trees. But um, so he says, well, you know, we picked the wrong year to hike the PCT. And I said, well, what do you mean? And, and a little happy person inside of me actually jumped to life because I thought, I have an excuse to quit now. Um, but he said, you know, the, there's it's a record snow year. It's like snowed like three times more than like the history of snow, you know, on the Sierra Nevada. And we, the whole trail is like buried and we can't get through and all of this stuff. And um, so um, we, I, uh, most of the backpackers, most of the, the through or big section hikers that summer had to, to do these bypasses and, and, and get off on these roads and hitchhike or take a bus or get around big stretches of trail to get to um, further north where it might be lower elevations and the snow was melted. So this passage I'm going to read to you, it's about a month into the hike. And by now I actually am a backpacker. I actually know what I'm doing, um, at least to the extent that I ever um, have known what I was doing, which isn't a whole lot, but um, more than a day one. And, um, and I'm back, and, and this passage I'm going to read you, I'm standing by the side of the road outside this town of, uh, called Chester, California, and <clears throat> I'm trying to hitch a ride. I'd never hitchhiked before I was on the PCT, and I haven't hitchhiked since. Um, but hitchhiking was a part of life then, especially that summer. And um, this guy pulls over, and you know, immediately, um, instead of just rolling down his window, he gets out of his car and starts walking toward me. And, um, and you know, what I would always do, my theory of you know, keeping myself safe when I was hitchhiking, is I would always try to really quickly assess um, whether uh, somebody was a serial killer. Um, <clears throat> Because we know we can tell those people, right? They, <laughs> we, they, <clears throat> they have T-shirts. So he's walking toward me, and, um, he, and I see the bumper sticker on his car says, Imagine, imagine World Peas. And you know, I take comfort in that, because I'm pretty sure that there has never been a serial killer who has imagined World Peas. <laughs> You know, I, I don't think, is there, a, has there ever been a hippie serial killer? I, I don't think so. Yeah. Somebody's got to be the first one. But anyway, um, he says to me, I can't give you a ride, um, but I've stopped because I want to talk to you. Um, I'm a reporter for the Hobo Times, and I go around interviewing hobos. And, and I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a hobo. I, I'm, I'm a long-distance hiker, and... Um, I'm hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, and, and he just doesn't pay any mind to that, and he just persists in thinking I'm a hobo. And, um, he, and he's, like, he's like my age, and he's um, got this kind of shaggy hair. He looks like somebody, um, I say in the book, like somebody who's sort of getting his PhD in something kind of like comparative studies and discourse in society, you know? And, um, and um, so, you know, he's like, no, you're, you know, he keeps persisting. I keep telling him. Um, I'm hiking the PCT. It's a national scenic trail, I offered, but he only continued looking at me. Oh, I should say, his name was Jimmy Carter. No relation. <laughs> it's a national scenic trail, I offered, but he only continued looking at me with a patient expression on his face, his unmarked notebook in his hand. As I explained to him what the PCT was and what I was doing on it, I saw that Jimmy Carter was not bad looking. I wondered if he had any food in his car. So if you're hiking a wilderness trail, what are you doing here, he asked. I told him about bypassing the deep snow in last in Volcanic National Park. I added I'd been on the trail about a month. How many nights have you slept with a roof over your head in that month, he asked. Three times, I answered after thinking about it. Is this all you have, he asked, nodding at my backpack and ski pole. Yeah, I mean, I have some things in storage too, but for now this is it. I put my hand on Monster. I should tell you my backpack's nickname. It was Monster. I named it. It felt like a friend always, but even more so in the company of Jimmy Carter. 
Well, then I'd say you're a hobo, he said happily. <laughs> and asked me to spell my first and last names. I did and then wished I hadn't. No way, he exclaimed when he had it all down on the page. Is that really your name? <laughs> yeah, I said and turned away as if searching for a car so he wouldn't read the hesitation on my face. So, Jimmy Carter said, we could say you're an actual stray. I wouldn't say that, I stammered. Being a hobo and being a hiker are two entirely different things. I looped my wrist into the pink strap of my ski pole and scraped the dirt with the tip, making a line that went nowhere. I'm not a hiker in the way you might think of a hiker, I explained. I'm more like an expert hiker. <laughs> I hiked 20 miles a day, day after day, up and down mountains, far away from roads or people or anything, often going days without seeing another person. Maybe you should do a story on that instead. He glanced up at me from his notebook, his hair blowing extravagantly across his pale face. He seemed like so many people I knew. I wondered if I seemed that way to him. I hardly ever meet hobo women, he half whispered. <laughs> so this is cool. <laughs> I am not a hobo, I insisted, more vehemently this time. Hobo women are hard to find, he persisted. <sighs> I told him that this was because women were too oppressed to be hobos, that most likely all the women who wanted to be hobos were holed up in some house with a gaggle of children to raise, children who'd been fathered by hobo men who'd hit the road. <laughs> I see, he said. You're a, f you're a feminist then. <laughs> yes, I said. It felt good to agree on something. <laughs> but none of this matters, I exclaimed, because I myself am not a hobo. This is totally legit, you know, what I'm doing. I'm not the only one hiking the PCT. People do this. Have you ever heard of the Appalachian Trail? It's like that, only out west. I stood watching him write what seemed like more words than I'd spoken. I'd like to get a picture of you, Jimmy Carter said. He reached into his car and pulled out a camera. Smile, he said, and snapped a shot. He told me to look for his piece on me in the fall issue of the Hobo Times, <laughs> as if I were a regular reader. <laughs> Articles have been excerpted in Harper's, he added. Harper's? I asked, dumbfounded. Yeah, it's this magazine that, I know what Harper's is. <laughs> and I don't want to be in Harper's. Or rather, I really want to be in Harper's, but not because I'm a hobo. <laughs> I thought you weren't a hobo, he said. He turned to open the trunk of his car. Well, I'm not, so it'd be a really bad idea to be in Harper's, which means you probably shouldn't even write the article, because standard issue hobo care package, he said, turning to give me a can of cold Budweiser beer and a plastic grocery bag weighed down with a handful of items at its bottom. But I'm not a hobo, I echoed for the last time with less fervor than I had before, afraid he'd finally believe me and take the standard issue hobo care package away. <laughs> Thanks for the interview, he said and shut the trunk. Stay safe out here. Yeah, you too, I said. You have a gun, I assume. At least I hope you do. I shrugged, unwilling to commit either way. Because I know you've been south of here, but now you're going north, which means you're soon entering Bigfoot country. Bigfoot? Yeah, you know, Sasquatch, no lie. From here all the way up to the border and into Oregon, you're in the territory where most of the Bigfoot sightings in the world are reported. He turned to the trees as if one might come barreling out at us. <laughs> A lot of folks believe in them. A lot of hobo folks. Folks who are out here. Folks who know. I hear Bigfoot stories all the time. Well, I'm okay, I think, at least so far, I said and laughed, though my stomach did a little somersault. In the weeks preceding my hike on the PCT when I decided not to be afraid of anything, I'd been thinking about bears and snakes and mountain lions and strange people I met along the way. I hadn't pondered hairy humanoid bipedal beasts. But you're probably fine, I wouldn't worry. Chances are they'll leave you alone, especially if you have a gun. Right, I nodded. Good luck on your hike, he said, getting into his car. Good luck finding hobos, I said, and waved as he drove away. I stood there for a while, letting cars pass without even trying to get them to give me a ride. I felt more alone than anyone in the whole wide world. The sun beat down on me hot, even through my hat. I jabbed my thumb at a car and realized only after it passed 
that it didn't look so good I was holding a beer. <laughs> I pressed its cool aluminum against my hot forehead and suddenly had the urge to drink it. Why shouldn't I? It would only get warm in my pack. I hoisted Monster onto my back and ambled through the weeds, down into the ditch, and then up again into the woods, which somehow felt like home to me, like the world that was mine in a way that the world of roads and towns and cars was no longer. I walked until I found a good spot in the shade. Then I sat down in the dirt and cracked the beer open. I didn't like beer. In fact, that Budweiser was the first whole beer I'd ever drunk in my life. But it tasted good to me, like beer tastes, I imagine, to those who love it, cold and sharp and crisp and right. While I drank it, I explored the contents of the plastic grocery bag. I took out, I took everything out and laid each item before me on the ground, a pack of peppermint gum, three individually wrapped wet wipes, a paper packet containing two aspirin, six butterscotch candies in translucent gold wrappers, a book of matches that said thank you, Steinbeck drug, a Slim Jim sa sausage sealed in its plastic vacuum world, a single cigarette in a cylindrical faux glass case, a disposable razor, and a short fat can of baked beans. I ate the Slim Jim first, washing it down with the last of my Budweiser, and then the butterscotch candies, all six of them, one after the other. And then, still hungry, always hungry, turned my attention to the can of baked beans. I pried it open in tiny increments with the impossible can opening device on my Swiss Army knife. And then, too lazy to rummage through my pack for my spoon, I scooped them out with the knife itself and ate them hobo style from the blade. This, this little thermometer fell while I was reading, and it's so cool. I, I uh, still have this, it's a little tiny thermometer that says REI, and I have this exact thing still hanging in my pack, still hanging on Mon Monster. Um, like a few days ago, I gave my first talk to um, kids. I went to my, my kids are in first and second grade in Portland, and um, I gave, I went to their school and gave a presentation about Wild, which was so intimidating, you know, really. I've been talking to grown-ups for so many months about it, and to talk to kids, you know, to really bring that story to them. Um, but I brought my pack, and I pitched my tent in their, in their gym, and it's like all the, a lot of the gear I had with me. And that was still dangling um, on my zipper where I put it all those years ago. Um, so I would love to open it up for questions now. I, I, I will tell you my, my, little, my favorite story about getting questions. Um, I know a lot of people sometimes feel shy when you first open it up, but back in, uh, like in the first week that Wild was out, like late March, um, I went to Boston, and I was reading at a bookstore there, and I read that passage that I just read to you, and I opened it up for questions, and this elderly gentleman in the front row um, immediately shot his hand up, and I called on him gratefully, and I said, and he said, um, have you ever had sex with anyone in exchange for food? <laughs> And, um, and um, it was also one of those situations because he was in the front row and it was a packed room like this. I had to repeat it into the microphone. <laughs> so I had to say, the gentleman would like to know if I've ever had sex with anyone in exchange for food. And um, the audience just was, you know, silent. You know, they were just like... <laughs> And, um, I, and I, I was dumbfounded for a moment, and then I, I said the only thing I could think of, um, I haven't, but have you had dinner yet? Um, <laughs> um, and sadly, he had already eaten, uh, so I still haven't done that. Um, but, you know, life's an adventure, so, who, you know. <laughs> So, so that was either the worst or best question I've ever received. Um, so that's out of the way. You guys, your competition is now, you know, you can't ask the worst question or the best one. Unless, you, maybe one of you could come up with something better. So let's take a chance. Who, and, and, don't, and so they're going to go around. Oh, you've got the microphone there. Okay, great. So my question to you, um, I read your book about a month ago, is how did you integrate back? Did you get depressed? Were you depressed to go back to the real world? Is it like postpartum? How did, how did you survive getting home. Right. Well, it was such a mixed experience because 
you know, anyone, how many of you in the room have gone on a, on a long hike, taken a long backpacking trip? Okay, good, cool. So I think, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I guess I'm going to speak for all of us. But I'll speak for myself, but I think it's kind of a universal experience. So, you, know, you're, you know, the whole time you're hiking, you're, you're working for this goal. You, know, you have this destination that you're trying to reach. And, and it's really exciting as you get nearer, and you can't wait to, to finish, you know, because when you finish, it means you, know, you can have as many cheeseburgers as you want. You know? um, and it's, you get to go back to that life of pleasure and um, just it's e of ease. You know? and, yet, and yet, so there's that. Like, I was really excited to be back. And so when I, when I finished my trip, I went to Portland. And it was great. It was fun. You know? I got to go to grocery stores that actually had food. You know? And um, I got to go out with my friends. And you know, I, I, got, I got to do all the, listen to music and do all the things that are really fun. Um, and then, but I also, you know, really was very sad when I was finishing my hike because I did feel like I had entered another world, a more beautiful one, one that was uh, simpler. You know, everything I needed was on my back and everything, I could provide everything for myself. I provided myself food and shelter and, you know, all of those, like I felt so self-sufficient and so strong and so resilient. And um, not, you know, it was just there was some. There's just incredibly that 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 power, that the beauty of just that kind of wild simplicity, I guess. And so, you know, when I went back to Portland, I felt happy and sad. I felt nostalgic, you know, um, and I and I wanted to get back out and backpack as soon as possible again, and I did. But I haven't taken a, a long a trip as long as this one since then. Yeah, thanks. At the end of the book, your feet seem so incredibly trashed to me. Yeah. And I wondered later, like you said that you went to work as a waitress, how long did it take for your feet to heal? And do you have any residual pain from any of that experience? No, you know, that's a question, that's the number one question I get. Uh, the, the, the toenails um, took, you know, several years to grow back and be normal again. Um, but pretty, you know, the, the, I mean, otherwise my feet uh, were fine. I, I went to, I had a massage like a couple months after my hike and didn't say anything to the massage therapist about my, my hike. And she said, your feet are like those of an animal. They're so strong, you know? And it's like, <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, I, <laughs> I didn't know that your feet could be strong, but, um, but they were, you know? And, um, but, you know, I think too, part of it, one of the, the, I'm 44 now, I was 26 on the trail, and I, and I do remember meeting, like, hikers who were, like, middle age, or, you know, they would be taking, like, ibuprofen every day, you know, to hike, and what was interesting is when I went on my hike, like, I had never, I'd been a runner and hiker and stuff, and I'd never, ever had any joint pain at all, any knee pain or anything, but, um, and on the trail, it wasn't, you know, a huge thing for me, but it was definitely, a, you know, in the, when you're hiking that long and carrying that much weight, like, I would wake up in the morning, you know, and it's like this backpacker walk where you have to limp into the day, you know? And, um, but as soon as I stopped hiking, that, that went away. It's now back. Um, <laughs> but it's just because I'm now in my 40s. And so I do think that part of that, like, my body's resilience had to do with um, my youth, you know? Um, I think that, that I would... If I took this long hike again, I would definitely, I'm convinced of the ultralight way, because um, carrying that much weight is hard. Could you talk a little bit about your process in terms of reconstructing this whole 100 day long, I mean, the, the, yeah. the book spans a, a much bigger time than that, but reconstructing that from journals? Uh huh. Just what, what it was like unpacking it? Yeah, so the hike. Um, I, I kept, I, you know, I was a writer. Like I said, you know, I didn't write wild because I, I took a hike. I took, I wrote wild because I'm a writer. And I was a writer when I went on the, the hike, and I'd always kept journals. And um, I wasn't consciously taking, like, keeping that journal so that someday I'd write a book. But when I went to write a book about it, it was really helpful. And really on just um, in two ways. One is just the logistics of, like, where I was when and what day, you know, I covered 17 miles and three miles and so forth. And then, um, and then also a lot of times, like that, that hobo scene that I just read to you, it was, it's a great example of because I was a writer, like as soon as I had that experience, like when, I'm, when I was sitting in the dirt, I mean, the part I don't say overtly in, in Wild is when I'm sitting in the dirt drinking that beer and eating those butterscotch candies and everything, I'm writing about it. I'm writing about what just happened. And the way I wrote it, even in my journal, like, you know, I wrote, 
it in dialogue. I wrote like what I said, what he said. Now, obviously, um, you know, it was my memory of the conversation we'd had 20 minutes before. In other places in the book, I didn't do that, and so I just had to re, you know, to the best of my abilities, remember um, the conversation we had, you know, many years ago. Um, and that's that's the whole conceit of memoir. It's you know the art of subjective truth, and I took really great care to. Um, to you know, tell like what really happened, but it's definitely you know as I remember it, and um, and, it, and where I could, I tried to like run. You know, I, I did get in touch with some people who I hiked with on the trail. Would say like, what do you remember from when we met, or do you remember you know um, this or that? You know, and so it's really helpful too. And sometimes I fact check. So um, those of you who've read the book remember will remember the three young bucks who were those foxy dudes um, who I was so happy to see. I mean, there's just nothing like uh, seeing a nice looking guy when you've been out there by yourself for all this. <laughs> so, especially three of them. So, um, so, those, so um, I have a couple stories around that. It was, so Richie was one of the, the, the three young bucks. And um, he lives in New Orleans. He was from New Orleans. He lives there now. And he wrote me a letter that somebody delivered to me. I was at Port Townsend in July teaching a workshop, and I gave a reading, and somebody came up to the sign-in and handed me a card, and it was from Richie, and because he's not on email, like that, he's he's such a cool and interesting guy, and he writes me this letter, and he says, Cheryl, I just, I want to thank you, you know, for so accurately representing us, you know, in Wild, and he's like, um, you know, that we were so strong and studly and handsome. <laughs> He's like, because that's exactly how I remember it myself, too. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I've been thinking about doing the PCT for a long time, and after reading your book, it kind of encouraged me to just get it done. So I'm planning on doing it in two years. But I was wondering how you perceive this book impacting the popularity of the PCT, and if you think that that might become a problem, or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I never could have imagined, you know, what would happen with Wild. I mean, this is, I've been a writer a long time, and I know what a writer's life is like, and, and, um, and I know it might seem like most writers' lives are like, you know, the bestseller list and all that kind of stuff, and that's, that's not where most writers live or, or do their work, you know? And um, so I, I didn't, I thought like, you know, five people would read the book, and, um, and but no, I, so I had no idea that so many people would read the book, and I get lots of emails from people saying, I'm gonna go on the PCT because I read this book. I'd never heard of the PCT before, and now I do. So I think that, I actually think that it will impact that it, that it has the potential to impact the, the trail really positively, um, especially if that equals a kind of consciousness around what, a, what an amazing treasure this is that we have. And, um, you know, the people who came before us made it, they built it, they fought for it for decades, um, and, 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 and then spent many more decades, you know, m really making it happen. And um, it's fairly a young trail. You know, 1968 was when it was designated a National Scenic Trail. It wasn't completed until 1993. And the work continues. And so what I'm hoping is that um, people will take this and, and it, it will mean, you know, that they'll have a consciousness of supporting National Scenic Trails and wild places. Um, the Pacific Crest Trail Association is the nonprofit that essentially advocates for um, and maintains and protects the trail. And so I'm hoping that they get just like a huge influx of members and support and things. Now, will it mean that a lot of people um, go out hiking, maybe, who wouldn't have? And is that a little bit annoying sometimes for the people who really like to go and not see people who are out there hiking for the first time? Yeah, but I think, I mean, I think that's all good. Like, I can't see any harm in people going into the, onto the trail. Can you? I think, I think, you know, it's a positive thing. Yeah. Yeah, it just, it reminds me of the um, other book about the cannoneering guy who got his hand trapped in the boulder and he ended up, I forget what that book's called, but the popularity of that particular area uh -huh. increased immensely after that book was published. And I was just curious if you yeah. thought the same would happen. And no, it's, it'll, yeah. it's very, it's gonna be interesting to me to see over time too, if it has, yeah. 
you know, a lasting, I, I mean, I do think that the, the, the main impact is just the, the consciousness of the trail, you know, that it's not so much, so many people are going to go hike the trail, but they'll know it's there and maybe value it, you know. Yeah. I think that you can value a trail having never set foot on it, you know. It really is a national treasure. Thank you for your Thanks. question. Good luck on your hike. You should do it. Why wait two years? Go next year. <laughs> So with that advice, uh, I have a daughter who wants to do this at about the same age that you did it. Uh huh. Um, any advice to the mother? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, it's funny, because it's, I'm a mom now too, and people always say, well, would you let your kids, you know, my advice is, you should just be so, you should feel so good that you have raised a daughter who's chosen to do this thing with her life and her time and her energy and her body, you know? So I think that, that of course you're gonna be worried about her and you're going to think of her every day and think of all the, you know, the terrible things that could happen. But you know, one of the things that, that I relied on, and maybe this will be helpful to you, is when I went out there, you know, I went by myself and the number one question I got is, aren't you afraid? Um, because we all know, first of all, just to go by yourself is kind of, it is kind of scary, but especially as a woman. And, you know, women and girls were like raised to be afraid of doing things by ourselves. We're, we're, we're you know, there are all these reasons, legitimate reasons too, to be afraid as a woman in this world. Um, violence against women is not a make-believe thing, you know. But what I decided to do was to, to really be kind of rational about risk. So statistically speaking, it would have been more dangerous for me to live in the city of Portland and drive around in my car and do all the things that I was doing that summer than it was to go walk alone in the wilderness. You know, there was much more chance of me. There's much more danger, you know, in the things we do every day, the things that we don't think are dangerous at all. Most of us probably drove here. Very, you know, high risk activity. More high risk, statistically speaking, than going on a hike. You know, so I sort of relied on that kind of reason. So just, just think that every day. Just say, at least she's not driving around in a car. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hi, congratulations on the success of your book. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to read it before it ever, before Oprah bestowed her blessings on it, because I had a good friend who knows I have a love for hiking and said, you should read this. So, mm -hmm. and I told two friends and then Oprah told everybody and then exactly. it was all over. <laughs> but my question for you is a fun one, I think. <laughs> um, and that is because of the success of your book, have you ever found out who actually took the condoms? I know. That's I, well, I'm thinking somebody's going to step up. Nobody because you put them in the, the re-gifting -gift, re area based upon that. <laughs> I no. loved it, and I'm thinking you somebody's going to step up and tell you who took them. I know, and I've talked. Well, you know, they haven't. I haven't heard from the, the Christian Eagle Scout father-son team. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's why. That's, maybe that's why. They, they were like, they took the condoms. But no, um, I don't know. But it is funny you should say that, because I, I, the, the condoms are still a mystery. But so... For those of you who haven't read the book, I, you know, after I, I get to that first stop, that first resupply stop, Kennedy Meadows. Have any of you ever been to Kennedy Meadows? Yeah. All right. Um, and I met these other hikers who said, you're insane, and um, you have to take some stuff out of your pack. And um, they helped me lighten my load. And, and so we went through my pack, and you know, we took away all the stuff I didn't need and put it in this at these resupply stops, there's always this thing called the hiker free box. And so it's just things that you don't need that other hikers might need. So I put this stuff in the box. And one of the things I put in the box was my foldable saw. Um, and I was in Los Angeles doing an event back in August. And there was an elderly gentleman in the front row. It's always the elderly gentleman in the front row <laughs> that caused problems. <laughs> You just stay right there. <laughs> every time, so I'm doing my reading, and every time I, I look up, he kind of, he, he like does this thing, like he's very animated, and like, and, and I um, was a little alarmed, but um, then, I, then I realized he's doing that because he's Ed. He is the trail angel who had the encampment at Kennedy Meadows, and he's famous on the trail. Anyone who threw hikes the PCT knows Meadow Ed. 
Um, when I met him, he, the, he didn't have that nickname yet. He was just dead. But he was the one who was there, and he fed us and all this stuff. Okay, I haven't seen him since the trail. Um, he says, Cheryl, it's me. And it's, I'm like, it's Ed, you know. And we had this reunion, like, in front of the whole audience. And he uh, pulls out, he has a backpack with him, and he pulls out um, my foldable saw. <laughs> Which, and the, the minute I saw it, I recognized it. It was my saw, you know. And he said, I kept this all these years. And um, he gave it back to me, and I was holding it, and, and then I realized, and I realized I was, you know, traveling all over the country. I just had carry-on. They wouldn't let me take a saw. <laughs> so I had to give it back to him, you know, because I couldn't put it in my pack still. So he also had this little kind of dish uh, thing that I, that too I recognized that was like one of the things on that list I read to you, and um, and it was just like just seeing it after all these years I was like, you know, it's like it looks like something you'd like serve like cheese and crackers on. Like what was I thinking, you know? <laughs> In case we want to have cheese and crackers on the trail. Um, but I should probably just take maybe two more questions. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm from Portland, and I read your book this summer. And my car broke down on Sandy Boulevard, and I was just devastated. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, what would Cheryl do? <laughs> so I got it together. We got to get the bracelets. I, you know, yeah. I prevailed. Um, so thank you for that. Thank um, you. But I just had book club at my house, and we read your book. And the ladies wanted to know. Um, well, they're mad at Eddie, and they wanted to know what happened to your family. Like, your mom seemed to be the center, mm -hmm. and without her, it all fell apart. And we wanted to know if, if you guys reconnected and if, what impact the book had on them, too, if they were mad at you or, you know, for telling the truth from your um, perspective. You know, it's actually been, I think a lot of people are, a lot of people who write memoir are, are terrified of doing it because inevitably, you know, you're telling your story, but inevitably the people who are close to you you know, get dragged into it to some extent too. And um, I've had nothing but, but positive responses from the family members who have talked to me or like my ex-husband loved the book and wrote me a very kind email um, about it. My, my brother loved it. We were, we, he read it before it came out and we had a, you know, just really the most profound conversation of our lives. Um, a lot of healing uh, was done because of you know, this book allowed me to really articulate at least my experience of our experience, and it and my brother was just rocketed by that because it brought him back to those places too, and my stepfather too. We, um, he came to I read in Duluth, Minnesota, and and he came, and um, we're not we don't talk a lot, or you know, we don't really we're not in each other's lives much, but but it was really moving to see him, and he hugged me and told me he loved me, and and I told him I loved him, and I do love him. So, um, you know, I think that, that there are a lot of, I mean, a lot of really hard things happened to my family in the years after my mom died. And I didn't write about all of them um, in full detail because I was telling my story um, and needing to protect other people's privacy. But, um, you know, I think that, that Wild has been a positive force in my life in that way. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. Um, so I'm only here because my best friend in Dallas read your book, and it moved her so much, I can't even begin to tell you. And I knew I had to read the book because that's what you do when your best friend reads something that's so moving for her. And um, so I came in case I could maybe get an, um, an autograph to surprise her and give it to her for her birthday, because I don't know if she'll get to see you. But, um, so I had two questions. Um, well, actually, she wrote a small ebook for herself um, to grieve the, the passing of her father 10 years ago uh -huh. that sent her into a tailspin. And so her small book was her way of dealing with it as well, right? right? Um, so I'd love it. Um, would it be possible to get you to sign that book for her? Of course, I'll sign anything. Okay. I've signed people's, I've signed people's boots. Okay. <laughs> so I you said will boots, I didn't say boobs. <laughs> I've signed people's boobs too, but I mean, okay. Well, I don't you have want those. Me to, I'll do anything. Yeah, I, a lot of people have brought their boots and I signed them. Um, right, well, so yeah, whatever you know. So you'll be doing that. We can do that after. afterwards. I'll okay, be great. doing it. Yeah. So then my last thing was what? What? I also read your other book, the tiny little, be tiny, tiny beautiful, beautiful things. things, and I most resonated with that book. And so I know you give really beautiful, honest, uh huh, straight advice. Right. So what, what advice would you give someone who finds themselves in their, in their shoes really resonating with your book, who's been in a tailspin, 
who's getting themselves out, who really wants to take that break and get away uh -huh. and you know, take away from nature and just come back anew. What advice would you give them? Great question. So yeah, the book that she's referring to, Tiny Beautiful Things, uh, which came out in July, um, because as I was finishing Wild in these last few years, um, putting the t final touches on Wild, I became this anonymous advice columnist uh, for a website called The Rumpus. I was, I'm Dear Sugar. And it, it's a lot of people, the thing about that column, how many of you in here have read Dear Sugar columns? OK. So the thing about that column is it's, when you hear advice column, it's the same way when I always heard advice column before I think, well, I'm not interested in reading that. Um, but what I'll say is this advice column I write is not like a regular advice column. It's not like I just do a couple paragraphs and tell you what to do um, from this place of superiority. It's rather they're really essays in which real people write me about their real problems, all sorts of problems about sex and money and love and parenting and all sorts of things. And I really write them back with, with my whole <coughs> with everything, with my whole heart and everything I have available to me as a storyteller. So I tell a lot of stories in the course of the column about my own life. Tiny Beautiful Things sort of forms a jigsaw puzzle of a memoir. It's beautiful. And all of that stuff. And so, so, you know, what's been interesting to me is because these books came out to get so soon together, and I think that a lot of people think that they're so different. One is about hiking. One is about giving advice. Um, and what I really think is that they're both about the same thing. They're both about bearing what we cannot bear. And there's different uh, takes on that, and I cover different territory in the two books, but that's the heart of my work. And so I would say the most rewarding thing for me, so many people who have read Wild, I mean, certainly people who have read Dear Sugar, they come at me, and they know they're going to have an emotional experience, and they talk to me about that. But the people who've read Wild, especially people who are like outdoors people, who picked up the book because it has a hiking boot on the cover. <laughs> and then they start reading it, and they realize that they are getting something that they didn't know that they were going to get. And now some people probably don't like getting that. You know, they don't like getting that emotional story about, it was so, one of the, the, the difficulties of, you know, the, there are so many blessings and great things about Wild doing so well. But one of the weird things is I've been in public places like at restaurants, having to listen to people talk about my book <laughs> and like not knowing I'm sitting next to them. And, um, and so I was in the Sonoma County Airport last week. And at the table right next to me, there, was, there are these, these three couples, and they start talking about Wild. Have you read Wild, one says. And the other's like, yes. And they start talking about it. And the, one of the women says, well, you know, it was too much about her mother. It really, she emphasized the death of her mother too much. And I'm like, oh, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just dying, you know, and I'm mortified. And, and I'm also hoping they won't recognize me because they, they will be mortified too. You know what I mean? It's just, anyway, it's just a, so, um, but where was I? Why was I telling you that story? You know, and it was, but, but more, the more common experience has been is that, that people, um, really, even if they don't know they're going to get that emotional story, they recognize themselves in it. You know, Like I said, at one point or another, we're all going to have to confront something that feels devastating to us. You know, a romantic heartbreak, a death of a loved one, a loss of a job, a loss of you know, your health, or whatever it is, and you have to face that. And so many people you know, have written to me about um, you know, how, their, how, how my story of transformation and healing which, you know, it didn't end the last day of my hike, but went forward into my life, informed theirs, you know? And so the advice, you know, I have to give to anyone is, like, keep walking, you know, really, that everything is done in the step, you know? And if that, that has everything to do with love and relationships and writing a book and walking a trail, that you have to keep faith in what's next. Um, that, you know, you have to keep moving forward. And I think that that is like this, the, the thing that I have held on to more fiercely than I've held on to anything. And I think that we'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll be signing books over there um, if, if you, anyone would like me to sign a book. Thank, thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you, everybody here. Thank you, everybody on the online community. Thank you.